it's uh, 5.30, I will say a few words of introduction to introduce uh, Soline. So Soline Sardoshow is, uh, I should not say the German uh, title, which is junior professor, but which corresponds to assistant professor in the German system. So Soline is assistant professor for one year now, about one year at uh, the economics department of uh, Humboldt University in Berlin. She graduated from PSC. I had the, the privilege to be her uh, supervisor. And she's been working on different uh, topics in political economy with a strong emphasis on culture. And uh, I think this is, Suline, your first uh, out of uh, dissertation uh, research paper. Is that correct? Uh, at least the first uh, that I see. Correct. Yes. Okay, so it's a significant uh, move. And uh, we're happy. I think it's also the first presentation of that paper. Is that correct? That's right. So it's, uh, uh, we're privileged to be uh, <laughs> being chosen as the first uh, outlay for this uh, paper. I welcome also your co-author, Philippe uh, Jaschke, who is online and uh, as is the tradition of this seminar, We'll try to handle the flow of questions that may be sent through the Q&A or through the chat. And uh, without uh, further ado, uh, Sulin, I give the floor to you. You know you're a regular attendee of this seminar, so you, you know the rules. You have uh, 45 minutes for the presentation. At uh, 6.15, we'll have uh, 15 minutes more for general discussion with the panelists and maybe questions that will be forwarded to you by Philippe or by Jesus or Simone from the, the, the chat. So please, Suling, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hillel, for the kind introduction. And thank you for the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present this paper here. This is joint work with Philipp Jaschke from the Institute for Employment Research and Marco Tavellini uh, from the Harvard Business School, who will be supporting me in answering all of your questions. As Hila said, this is the first time I'm presenting this paper. So uh, early stage work and very excited for your comments. Um, so what we ask in this paper is basically, do refugees converge to local culture? And we're gonna provide some evidence for German regions. So let me briefly talk about the motivation for this paper. As you all know, in recent years, the world has seen a dramatic increase in the number of refugees. The UNHCR estimates the number of forcibly displaced people in the world to 70 million, and Europe has experienced uh, a very sharp increase since 2015. And alongside with this increase, there has been a rising salience of immigration in the political space and in the public debate. We've seen the rise in support for right-wing parties. We've seen anti-immigration policies being introduced. And what has also become a hot topic is the ability of refugees to culturally assimilate. So the compatibility, the cultural compatibility between refugees and locals. And this debate has in parts even dominated the discussion on the economic integration of refugees. Facing this, the political divide and the, and the strong uh, heterogeneity and preferences that within countries, there has been a renewed focus on, on local rather than national culture. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask three main research questions. One of them is also named in the title, do refugees culturally assimilate? And we look at this in the short run. And if so, do they differentially converge to local culture? So is there a, lo a role for local culture in the assimilation path of refugees? Second, we ask what are the local determinants of cultural assimilation, uh, both on the side of the native host community, but also on the side of the refugee and immigrant community. And lastly, we're interested in investigating the interplay between economic integration and cultural assimilation. As I've said before, we focus on Germany for two reasons. First of all, we have a natural experiment with a sharp increase in meaningful size of asylum applicants since 2013. This has been, despite warning, 
been largely unexpected for local authorities. And I'm going to argue that there is that we can exploit quasi random assignment of refugees to NUTS2 regions. So the NUTS2 regions are the unit of observation that we're going to look at. There are 38 in Germany, and they're equivalent to Raumordnungsregionen, which are spatial planning regions. The other reason why we, we focus on Germany is that we have very novel data that allows us to look at the attitudes and preferences and socio-demographic characteristics of 8,000 refugees and match those attitudes and preferences to locals. Um, we have about uh, 34,000 locals in our sample. And what we do is we fix locals' preferences at baseline and we construct a cultural similarity measure between refugees and locals. And then we're going to run individual level regressions with district and survey fixed effects and a rich set of, of controls. Just to give you a preview of our findings, so we ask in this paper, do refugees converge to local culture? The answer is yes. Refugees culturally assimilate, even in the short run. We estimate that they close the cultural gap by 5% every year. We also find that they converge asymptotically, so the speed of convergence decreases over time. And we do find that, indeed, there's a role for local rather than, than national culture in the assimilation path of refugees. Next, and maybe most interestingly, what we find is that threat is a driver of cultural assimilation. Refugees assimilate faster in regions that support right-wing parties and where there are more hate crimes committed against refugees. And refugees assimilate more slowly if the local population is more open and in refugees and immigrant networks are larger. When we look at the interplay between economic and cultural assimilation, what we find that in threat environment, cultural assimilation increases, but economic integration slows down, which is sort of a hint towards potential substitutability between economic and cultural integration. Since you're all, uh, we, we have a knowledgeable audience here, I will not spend too much time on the literature review. This, this is just an incomplete list of strands of the literature that we're touching upon. One of them is on refugee migration, where a lot of papers have looked at the natives' responses to the refugee influx in terms of political preferences or preferences for redistribution, but also more recently, the effect of refugee uh, integration policies. Then, of course, we relate to the literature on immigrant assimilation, most notably the work of Abramitsky, Bustan, and Eriksson, on the immigrant assimilation in the US, and more recently, Vicky Fuka with her work in Germany, the US, and France. And then more broadly, we relate to the literature in cultural economics, the diversity and cultural transmission mechanisms that we have investigated theoretically and empirically also in my paper with Hilel and Arthur. For the rest of the presentation, I'll briefly talk about the background. We'll not spend too much time so that we can get to the data, um, the empirical strategy, and discussing the identifying assumptions. I'm going to talk about the main results, and then we're going to dive into the local determinants of assimilation before I conclude. So this is just to show you the magnitude of the increase in asylum applications to Germany. So here we plot the monthly asylum applications in 1000 to Germany and what we see that especially after 2015, we see an exponential increase in the number of asylum applications. In the second half of 2016, this decreases and this is exactly when the EU-Turkey deal kicks in that basically prohibited refugees from crossing the Turkish border to the Mediterranean and entering the European Union. I'm going to later argue that this unexpected increase led to a quasi-exogenous allocation of refugees, and I'm going to show you why we think this is actually the case in our data. Speaking of data, so let me briefly discuss the different sources that we're going to combine. As mentioned before, we have a representative survey of asylum seekers to Germany that have applied between January 1st, 2013, the end of 2016. There are three waves. We have 8,000 adult persons who have been surveyed between one and three times. And we have a whole battery of questions regarding migration, employment status, and most importantly, values and attitudes of refugees. 
And we also have information on pre-entry characteristics, which are going to be important for our identification later. We match this data with the German socioeconomic panel, which is a longitudinal study of 34,000 private households. What is very useful in the setting is that the German socioeconomic panel was administered and run in the same way by the same institutions, uh, which allows us comparability in the type of administration of the survey, so it's face-to-face -face interviews, but also comparability in the questions. So the questions and the framing of the questions has been the same, and also the scales used for different, uh, for different questions are the same. And what is also important is because we look at local heterogeneity of culture, we need to have a large sample size. So the typical surveys that have about 1,000 or 1,500 observations to, to get a representative sample of the national population will not allow us to dive too deeply into the local heterogeneity. And this data set, because of its scope, allows us to compare regions with one another. So I've been talking about the NUTS2 regions, and this is sort of a visual representation of those 38 NUTS2 regions in Germany. Here we plot two sets of questions. Um, one is about the negative reciprocity of non-refugees in the region and the positive reciprocity of non-refugees. So negative reciprocity would be if somebody were to harm you, would you retaliate? The mirror image would be positive reciprocity. So if somebody helps you, would you go out of your way and help them as well? This is just to show you that there is substantial heterogeneity across German regions and that this heterogeneity also differs across types of questions. So the combination of questions will allow us to sort of uniquely identify uh, local culture. How do we measure cultural similarity? So this is, we, we follow the, the literature and constructing a Euclidean cultural similarity measure. And what we do is we take the refugee I and we compute the pairwise difference to all locals living in the same that's two region. Yeah, let's say we do that for negative reciprocity between refugee I and local one, refugee I and local two, three, until we have all the locals. We compute the Euclidean distance for one of the question and then do that for all questions and take the mean. We measure locals culture at baseline. So before 2030, before the influx of refugees to not endogenize local preferences. What we really want to do is we want to measure assimilation. So the movement of refugees towards locals, and we don't want to um, look at um, preferences that might have been endogenous to refugee immigration. So we fix that before. The type of questions that we use is multifold, as I've said before. There's positive and negative reciprocity. Many of these questions include several sub-questions. Um, we have generalized trust, the type of leisure activities you're engaged in, your interest in politics, et cetera. So to just give you a broad disclaimer, this is a very narrow and operational definition of culture. So we, we have a set of attitudinal questions that is available for both locals and for refugees. And there's we, we basically take all of the questions that have exactly the same framing and the same scale and take these questions to include them in our measure. It's important to note that these are stated and not revealed preferences. Yeah, so we, we don't have sort of a, a measure for, for revealed preferences, but we still believe that they can tell us something about the ability of refugees to identify socially desirable responses. Yeah, so there's some information content in, in those stated preferences. And because we look at short run assimilation, we can't use outcomes that have been typically used in, in the literature. Um, Mark has been using, for instance, naturalization and intermarriage rate in some of his papers. Obviously, we have the naming patterns used by Abramitsky and co-authors. Those typically do not materialize in the short run. So let me get to our empirical strategy. So our estimating equation takes the cultural similarity of a refugee I living in district T, the D at survey T to the locals living in the same nuts two region. So this is basically our assimilation measure. And then our main exogenous variable is the month since arrival. 
Yeah, and we also take a Munson's a, a polynomial term in here to account for potential nonlinearities of the effect over time. And then we have a whole vector of individual and district level controls, age, country of origin, work experience at entry, um, marital status, and so on and so forth. And we have district level controls such as unemployment rate, uh, population density, and the share of refugees in the county. We include district fixed effects and survey year fixed effects. So we, we compare refugees that were assigned to the same district and responded to the survey in the same year. And we sort of have a vector of dummies that makes sure that we compare people that have answered to the same set of questions, just to make sure that there's no compositional effect in the questions driving our results. And just to plot yeah. this very... Yes? Sorry, can I ask you a simple question? For the refugees, is the survey run in German or in their own maternal languages? And it, the same refugee that is surveyed at different point in time might change the language or not? So the refugees are um, interviewed in their native language. So there are, I think, about 12 languages in which the survey is administered, like Arabic, Pashto. Uh, there are a lot of questions just to make sure that they actually understand the questionnaire. Thanks. OK, so just to show you a raw correlation between Munson's arrival and cultural similarity, we see sort of that the duration of stay is associated with a higher cultural similarity between refugees and locals. This obviously masks a lot of concerns, right? So what we're trying to do is, is we want to identify the effect of duration of stay on cultural similarity. And there are multiple threats to identification that could limit the causal interpretation of this regression. So first, there could be selection on the side of authorities. Right? So did refugee allocation patterns change over time? And our identifying assumption here is that authorities did not become worse over time at culturally matching refugees with locals. Yeah, if they were to become worse at culturally matching them over time, that would mean that more recent arrival cohorts uh, would be culturally more distant to the local culture, not because they have been less exposed to the local culture, but just because the cultural match has worsened. It's important to note that this is a much weaker requirement than no cultural matching at all. So it's okay if there are level differences. In other words, if culturally similar refugees are always assigned to Hamburg and culturally very dissimilar refugees are always assigned to Munich, um, then that is not a problem for our, our identification. It only becomes a problem if that changes over time. A second source of threat to identification would be ex post sorting of refugees. So even if authorities exogenously assign refugees to certain cultural spaces, over time refugees move to regions that are culturally closer. We would then observe the same correlation that refugees who have been here for a longer time would be more assimilated, not because they were exposed to culture, but because they moved to more culturally similar spaces. And we carefully address all of these threats to identification. So let me start with the selection on the side of authorities. So what we would have ideally is we would observe the preferences of refugees before they enter, and then we would check whether the quality of the cultural match worsened over time. We don't have the preferences of refugees at entry, but what we do have is observable characteristics at entry. So we have age, gender, the country of origin, and the years of work experience at the time of arrival. And what we do then is we check whether the probability of being assigned to a certain location based on observables changed over time. So we do that geographically across German states, but we also do that across types of regions. So let me just quickly show you what we do is we take the year of arrival, we multiply it with the pre-entry variable, and we look at whether the likelihood of being assigned to an urban versus rural district based on your gender changed 
in 2014 compared to 2015, in 2016 compared to 2015. We do the same for high versus low unemployment. We overall, we don't find a regime change over time. Here, the, the age variable comes out significantly, but if we were to control for multiple hypothesis testing, this would not pass the 10% bar. And what we, what we do lastly is to make sure that it's not just the overall quality of refugees becoming culturally distant over time. So you could imagine that over time, just worse and worse cultural matches arrive in Germany. We, in a robustness check, we include year of arrival fixed effects to really just look at the arrival cohort within 12 months and their assimilation paths and the results hold. So overall, we find no evidence that assignment officers change policy over time, at least based on these uh, pre-entry characteristics that are observable. Yeah? And because preferences are hard to monitor both for the local population and for the refugee, refugees, we think it's even more unlikely that, that there were cultural matches and that the, those cultural matches changed over time, worsened over time. Then another threat to identification would be sorting on the side of refugees. And we have one quick fix for that and two more substantive things that we're, we're going to look at. So all of our specifications are an intent to treat. So we have the region of assignment of the refugee and we have the region of residence. But what we calculate is the cultural similarity to locals in the region of assignment and not the region of residence. Yeah, so we interpret our results as an intent to treat. There are non-compliers who move, which are about 25%, but what we do is we basically say we pretend as if you stayed in the region of assignment, which would downward bias our results. But what we also do is in 2016, there was a, an integration act passed in Germany, which prohibited the free movement for a subset of refugees. Yeah, so they were not allowed to move after a certain date. And when we run the same regressions for the subset of, of refugees who fell under this residency obligation, we find that the results still hold. And lastly, which is, I think, also an interesting corollary finding of this paper, we look at cultural selection, uh, internal cultural sorting of refugees more explicitly, right? So we have the region of assignment and we have the region of residence, and we compare the cultural similarity of non-movers to the cultural similarity of movers to the region of residence. And we actually find that there's no cultural selection of refugees inside of Germany, at least in the short run. So overall, we don't think there's much evidence to support that ex post cultural selection drives our results. So with all of this in mind, let me turn to the, the main table of this paper. Here we have the months since arrival and the months since arrival squared. And as I said before, we successively introduce a bunch of controls and fixed effects. We end up with our preferred specification in column seven, which includes all the individual and district level time varying controls, the compositional fixed effects, the survey of fixed effects, and the district fix. Our coefficient remains rather stable across those specifications, and we see a significant and positive impact of months since arrival on the cultural similarity between refugees and locals and that this effect decreases over time. So we, we find an asymptotic convergence. How do we interpret this coefficient? So I've shown you here, this is sort of the mean uh, Euclidean cultural similarity index minus 1.74 between refugees and locals. The average cultural similarity among locals is minus 1.31. So basically, the as we would expect, the cultural similarity among locals is higher than, than that between refugees and locals. So we end up with a certain gap of 0.33 approximately. And then we calculate uh, how many months does it take to close that gap. So when would an average refugee become as culturally similar to a local than locals are amongst one another. So what we end up with is that every year refugees close this cultural gap by about 
we believe that this effect is not driven by selection or sorting and the results are robust to a variety of things, including year of arrival fixed effects, as well as different measures of cultural similarity. What we also look at are the dimensions of convergence, and we find that reciprocity, leisure activities, interest in politics, sort of these little bit more malleable everyday traits are converging while in the short run, while more fundamental values uh, do not seem to be converging, at least as quickly. Then I promised you that, that we're going to look at the importance of local culture, and this is what we're going to do here. So what we do here is we compare the position of the local culture in the cultural space to the average German culture. So we have this hybrid average German culture and we look at the distance of the local culture to that German culture. And when, then we look at the assimilation path of refugees depending on whether they've been assigned to a very culturally distinct location. And what we find is that if you're assigned to a cultural space that is more distinct from national culture, refugees actually differentially converge to that distinct culture. What we also do is we look at the within Nats2 region cultural dispersion. So we look at how heterogeneous or homogeneous the population inside that Nats2 region is. And we find that the more dispersed the local culture, the harder or the more slowly the refugees converge to that culture. Yeah, So it's just harder for them to potentially identify the benchmark culture that they can converge to. So if the region of assignment is culturally distinct and internally homogenous, we see a faster assimilation to that region. Now, let me turn to the local determinants and the second part of the paper. What we try to look at is what is the role of the host community in shaping assimilation patterns of refugees? And there are, this is ex anti ambiguous. Yeah. So if you're assigned to an open environment, it could be that this encourages cultural assimilation through exchange and interactions with local. There's a vivid exchange. This would speed up the assimilation process, but it could also decrease cultural assimilation, mainly through lower pressure, since there is an acceptance of a diverse set of norms. Yeah. So we all don't want to change our preferences. We all uh, hold our beliefs dear to us. And maybe if there's an accepting environment, we're more likely to stick to our preferences and norms. And the mirror image of that is the threat environment. So if there's a lot of pressure, so if you're um, experiencing pressure or you're afraid of being harassed, you might increase your assimilation effort. Yeah. Also, there could be some sort of backlash effect, or you could be socially isolated in a space where there's a, a high threat environment. So we test that in our paper. So, so I will show you both the linear specification and the polynomial specification, because we see important nonlinear effects here. So what we do first is we take openness, which is a concept of uh, in social psychology, the so-called big five personality traits, and openness has been shown to be rather stable over time and is less of a political measure, right? So this has been shown to be associated with a less ethnocentristic mindset and more um, favorable views towards a pluralistic society without really pinning it down to immigration policies. So we take that measure and we find that if you're assigned to a place where the locals are more open, the speed of assimilation decreases yeah, linearly. Now we move to the threat environment. And what we do is we take the alternative for Germany, the 2017 vote. The party was founded in February 2013, uh, but has not been an anti-immigration party really until 2015. So because this is already post-refugee influx, we refute to the NPD vote, which is the nationalist of Germany in 2013, so pre-refugee influx. And this is really a Nazi party. This is plain out uh, national socialists. And what we see here is that 
that the speed of assimilation increases in places where there's more right-wing voting. And what we also do is we take the hate crimes against refugees in 2014 and 2015, and we find that there's an increase in assimilation in places where there are hate crimes against refugees. We also, in a robustness check, make sure that we only look at refugees that have arrived after the occurrence of hate crimes to make sure that this is not endogenous as well. And the results remain the same. So we find evidence for this threat-based assimilation, and especially at the beginning. So I showed you here that what we, what we do is, in, in this specification, we also include the months since arrival squared and the months since arrival squared times the mediator. And once we include the polynomial term, we see a differential pattern for the threat environment. So especially at the beginning, refugees assimilate in threat environments. Now we ask whether this threat hypothesis also applies to economic integration. So what we do now is we run the exact same thing, but we take the employment status of the refugee at the time of the interview. And what we see is exactly the opposite. So in places where there is a strong right-wing vote and where there are hate crimes against refugees, we see slower economic integration. Yeah, whereas before we, we saw faster cultural assimilation. So refugees are less likely to have a job at the time of the interview in high threat environments. What we also look at then is to, to think more carefully about what could the threat hypothesis imply as well? What is the interaction between economic and, and cultural assimilation? We look at the ethnic enclaves of, of, uh, of refugees. So first, we look at the size of the community, we look at the cultural simulation of peers, and we look at the economic integration of peers. And again, for all of these dimensions, ex ante, this is ambiguous. A larger size of the community may increase the simulation through informal networks and information flows. We've seen work done on this in the labor market, so larger networks facilitating job creation, but it also could decrease assimilation, like Ericsson shows for the case of Nor Norwegian migrants or, or Lazir in, in his analysis of, of language acquisition. So this is what we do here. So we take the share of refugees in the Nuts 2 region, and as a proxy for the size of the network, we also take the share of immigrants that come from the same origin region. And for both of these network sizes, we find a negative effect on cultural assimilation. So the larger the network, the more slowly cultural assimilation happens. From our data set of refugee surveys, we construct the average cultural similarities of all other refugees in the Nuts 2 region. We do not find a significant effect here, although it's also negative. And then we look at the e economic integration of peers. So the employment of immigrants from the same origin region and the wage of immigrants from the same origin region. And we find that more economically integrated peers decrease the assimilation speed of refugees. So again, there seems to be an interesting interaction between economic and cultural assimilation, which might even hint to the fact that these two might be substitutes or at least um, operate in, in different ways. Okay, so this brings me to my conclusion slide. So what we've shown here is that refugees assimilate to, to local culture asymptotically. And we find some evidence for the threat hypothesis of assimilation. Um, hate crimes and right-wing ideology increases the speed of cultural but not economic assimilation. We find that larger networks and a more open host society decrease the speed of cultural assimilation. And economic and cultural assimilation could potentially act as substitutes within individuals and within the network. So it could potentially be that refugees exert more effort in at least signaling cultural integration to overcome hurdles or discrimination that they experience on the labor market in the social sphere. And what question this raises in terms of policy implications is whether we should take cultural assimilation sort of as an unconditional measure of quote-unquote successful integration, 
or if it is indeed a result of pressure or threat or fear of violence, whether we should think more carefully about these trade-offs. Um, as I've said at the beginning, this is a quite early stage work, so um, we're thinking about various things to improve on and extend in the future. So first of all, thinking of cultural spaces in administrative borders is in and of itself arbitrary, right? So that we think of French culture and German culture and Italian culture sort of limited by borders might be an arbitrary thing, as is um, the, the Nuts 2 region as a cultural entity. So maybe we can think about other ways of identifying cultural clusters that are not sort of um, administratively based. Also, we want to dive more into the economic versus cultural integration. So what is so so we, we think about looking at assimilation paths of refugees once they're in, in employment. So does once they've achieved that bar, are they going to slow down uh, cultural assimilation? And we're thinking about conceptualizing potential trade-offs in the model. So assimilation effort and discrimination lead to successful integration, both in the social sphere, but also in the economic sphere, and exploit more uh, the non-linearities in the assimilation path. Uh, and maybe a model can shed light on that uh, further. Yes, so I think I'm done. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Suline. You're uh, not on time. Uh, you're five minutes early, which uh, I guess uh, is, is showing you're not completely assimilated, right? German uh, are on time. Uh, yeah, I'd have to calculate the month since arrival. It's been, it's been so many. What, what, what is the speed of convergence, remind me? <laughs> I mean, for me, it's probably more than 5%. <laughs> But what if you, maybe there's also overshooting. That, that, can, that, that could be something to be modeled. Yeah, interesting uh, hypothesis. The good news is that we have about 20 minutes instead of 15 for general discussion, which is good because I have nine questions, but uh, I give it back <laughs> to Simone to do the allocation of time and uh, I will make a selection for my own questions. Okay, so there are a few unanswered questions in the in the Q&A. Eli, Wagner, Sekou, I'm allowing the three of them to, to unmute. And in the meantime, Ilan, if you want to start. Okay, so I, I will, uh, my first question was actually the one, the last point uh, that Suleen talked about. So th the first question I wrote is that because from the preview of the results, it's, it's really hard to figure out a theoretical model that would predict that what you find that can be. Uh, so they, they, in, in a way, they are a bit hard to believe and hard to make sense of in, in a, so I'm maybe preempting in question by Arthur, but uh, <laughs> I think, you know, having, you know, a model that can generate these different uh, results would be reassuring. But, that's exactly what you said in your last point. Uh, and I, I think it would be really a very strong addition. That's for the theory part. Now for the, the, the threat thing, uh, of course, a worry is, uh, which you alluded to in your interpretation, maybe uh, not going completely uh, all the way to that interpretation is that as a interviewee, you may bias your answers you know, you feel the threat and you answer what you think you are expected to answer given, you know, the local environment. So that's, of course, who would bring a completely different uh, interpretation. So even though you said you look at short term, it would be good, I think, at least very even anecdotally to find some behavioral uh, outcomes such as naming patterns, consumption patterns, or things that would point to, to actual, uh, not just de jure, but de facto uh, assimil cultural uh, assimilation. Um, now, still with this threat uh, thing, uh, I'm not familiar with this literature. I mean, we see a lot 
on backlash, you know, that you become more of what you are if you find uh, hostility. But I didn't see that you mentioned a lot of uh, studies on this, so it would be good maybe to document more of this, uh, because this is more surprising, at least for someone with, uh, who is not familiar with this uh, sociological uh, literature. Um, it would seem good maybe to, to use segregation data somehow. We know it exists at a very fine grain level. That could be a good addition and a potentially you know, mediating channel that you may want to use and it's easily uh, accessible. Um, and, uh, and of course, if we take your conclusions in terms of policy implications, it's not, you know, what, what does it mean? We should educate people to be more intolerant to so that this creates more incentives so you see what i mean so i I'm just wondering how you frame your policy implications uh, from the analysis thank okay you. thank you very much Hila, for all of these useful comments so so let me so i agree with you that we have to motivate that with, with with some theory or at least a conceptual framework and that we will have to be more clear about the evidence that already exists. I mean, there's, for instance, a paper on naming patterns of Japanese immigrants in the United States before and after Pearl Harbor. And after Pearl Harbor, Japanese Americans were more likely to name their children more American sounding names. Yeah. And this is also a little bit uh, going in the, into the direction of threat papers. Of course, but here there is the, you know, is it a change in preferences or in incentives? So exactly, exactly. Changes in preferences, not incentives. Exactly. We, I, I, I think this is more of an assimilation effort story that than really an assimilation story, right? So, so let me just show you a very like crude idea that we've drawn up like two days ago and and the idea is a little bit like if you imagine that people like to keep their preferences so or at least have have a preference for a certain speed of assimilation yeah they don't want to they don't want to quickly divert from their preferences but they want to follow a certain path yeah and that there's potentially a threshold of cultural assimilation at which refugees can enter the labor market. Yeah, so you have to reach a certain level of cultural similarities to locals that can be language skills, that can be sort of how you behave and interact, maybe in outward facing jobs, that you can enter the labor market. So in a low threat environment, your preferred assimilation path and the minimum threshold of entering the labor market would sort of give you a T, a time T at which you can then enter the labor market at a given preferred speed of assimilation. If you assume that in a high threat environment, so in anti-immigration settings, the the threshold for entering the labor market is higher. So they would not be happy with sort of moderate level of assimilation, but you would have to have a high level of assimilation to uh, enter the labor market. This would move the timing of, of entry to a later stage. But now imagine that refugees optimize their timing, uh, they optimize um, the their labor market outcomes and put assimilation effort in as a function to achieve that so potentially what they would do in high threat environments is speed up their assimilation especially at the beginning to be able to enter the labor market at an earlier stage yeah so this is exactly what we would then find in our empirical data yeah they will still end up uh, economically less integrated than in low threat environments, but they will be more culturally assimilated at the same time. This is just a very crude conceptual idea about how we could potentially think about this. But if you think of cultural assimilation as more of an effort story, yeah, and economic integration more as a cooperative game between locals and refugees, then you might then you might end up uh, with this theoretical prediction. This also responds to your, your um, 
question on biased answers, I agree. This is basically signaling cultural assimilation. It doesn't have to be actual change in preferences. And which supports the idea that this is potentially assimilation effort rather than actual assimilation in that setting. Um, we will definitely look at the segregation data. This is actually already on the list. And the policy implication is not as much to say we should all threaten refugees. Um, it's to say no, it I should... you have a different proposal. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's to say, should we think about the convergence in, in values and norms as an appropriate measure of successful integration? Because I, I see a lot of German institutions writing reports on the cultural integration of immigrants. And what they do is they, they look at the response in certain fields in, in religiosity and in, in preferences. And they say, look how integrated our immigrants are based on the stated preferences. And this is just to question this idea that a convergence in stated preferences is really sort of this natural, successful integration or whether this can come from a very different motivation and maybe start to, to think about taking assimilation as a goal, as an integration or as an immigration policy goal, questioning that dimension, I would say, is the, is the policy perspective. Thank you. Okay, so Ilal, we have four people on the line. Andreas is the first. Okay, uh, yes, thanks, Suleen. This is a really uh, fascinating paper. What I'm still trying to understand a bit better is first what your index really captures and what the, also first the differences between these German regions really captures how, how large I should, I should think these differences are and, and also what components of your index actually drive that. And I mean, one item where you also indicated that this was one of the items where you see convergence was leisure activities. I, I, I don't know specifically what that means, but it, it got me wondering whether, I mean, could that something captures like the local amenities? I mean, if I live in the mountains, at some point I go hiking and skiing, um, but it's, it's about the environment I face there, not about my preferences or assimilation versus the people at the coast. So, I mean, I think it would be extremely helpful to first learn a bit more about the index, also kind of what it captures between German regions, I guess, and then also what drives your results here. Thank you, Andreas. So that's exactly right. I mean, uh, this is what Achimoglu would say. It's like institution, is it institutions or is it culture, right? So what, what comes before, like, are there good amenities because people like to go hiking or, um, uh, do people go hiking because uh, they're good amenities? So it's it's very difficult to disentangle sort of the the institutional factors from the the cultural factors. That is true. Let me just show you the table on the dimensions. So uh, many of these questions include several sub questions. Yeah, and what we see is, for instance. We see this is obviously controlling for multiple hypothesis testing here. Um, so what we see here, for instance, is positive reciprocity is a big dimension of convergence. So if somebody helps you, would you go out of your way and help them as well? It, it contains three sub questions. Uh, let me just look at them. If somebody does me a favor, I am willing to reciprocate it. The second one is I make particular effort to help someone who has previously helped me and I am prepared to incur costs myself to help someone who has previously helped me. This might capture some institutional dimension or it might just capture that you're in a potentially socially cooperative way or a place. I mean, interest in politics pops up. Um, so how interested are you in political issues? The activity part includes questions like, um, just let me look at it. How often do you go to eat or drink in a cafe, restaurant, or bar? Artistic and musical activities, taking part in sports, going to sporting events, etc. So this could be capturing some local amenities, that's for sure. It just all we can say is that 
refugees start to respond more similarly to these questions than locals do. And if locals don't have the amenities, they would probably also just answer at a lower base to that. So we basically just look at sort of the difference between locals and refugees, and that should potentially average out this idea that there are level differences between regions. I don't know if that addresses your, your concern. I mean, my, my thing was, if, if, you, if you're not used to going to a cafe or to going skiing, just to stick with that example, and refugees over time learn how to ski, they would get more similar without, I mean, because the amenities are there to learn it. Um, and you would call that cultural assimilation. Yeah, um, but only if, if, if they converge to the baseline of the natives. It could also be that refugees arrive and locals just go less to cafes and sporting events than they used to, right? So we're not really saying in which direction they converge, but we, we only make assumptions about the distance in the responses. So I don't know I, why we would, we would be concerned with level know. differences across regions. I will cut the discussion specifically on this because I see there is a, a long list of uh, questions. At least what I suggest now, we have three registered uh, people to ask questions. So I suggest they first ask the question. So Eli, Seku, and then Michael. So you take okay. the free set of questions so you can manage the time for these three panelists. So uh, Eli, then Seku, and then Michael. Yeah. Hello, Suleen. Uh, super interesting work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there is a consensus that this threat, threat hypothesis is, uh, is hard to believe, but still interesting. And that probably uh, I, can, I cannot agree more with Eli that it it will be great to have some theoretical model to explain it better. But I think I got quite convinced by your argument. So, so basically, it's clear that in, like, in a region with higher support for right-wing parties, I mean, what we would expect is initially higher segregation, higher isolation of refugees, and so higher tendency to stay you know, with, your, with your peers, and so not to necessarily uh, uh, integrate. I mean, this is what I think most of the literature would say. But then, then I understand your point that if you want that, you know, not to be threatened too much or that, or at least to, to make your situation livable, you need to show that you are ready to assimilate just a little bit. But then this means that basically you have an absolute level of convergence or you have a target level of assimilation. But this means also that basically you could have a placebo test if this theory is, is correct, because what is different in this Nazi region or this region with higher support for distribution is that the initial cultural distance is very high. So there is a lot of ground to cover and somehow. So that's why they need to, the, the rate of assimilation is higher. Okay. But then it means also that normally you shouldn't find this heterogeneity if you just look at how attitudes of refugees change or the change relative to a national... I'm sorry, we, we, we need to move on. Otherwise, we will have no time. Okay, okay. The, so basically, my point is that you could look at just simply convergence relative to a national culture. You shouldn't find this heterogeneity normally. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's my point. Thanks. C'est cool. Yes, um, thanks a lot, Sulin, for the nice presentation. I just have two quick comments. So one was goes in the direction of Eli. My idea is that if you are allocated to a location where the dis initial distance is great from your original cultural background, then the room for convergence is, is just greater. And this could maybe explain the, the threat hypothesis effect. And my second point is just a suggestion on the mechanism. Maybe I was wondering how they converge and you have questions on contacts with natives. So maybe you can use that to discuss a bit how refugees learn about the local culture and whether more intensive contact with natives uh, helps. So these are my two points, thanks. Michael? 
Yes, thank you so much. Th thank you very much, uh, Sudin, Philip, uh, uh, Marco. It's a it's a really nice paper. Right now, you are framing it as a as a, a paper about refugees. You're presenting it in economics of migration. The, that's great. I urge you to consider if you want to make it more of a general interest paper. Uh, the possibility of linking it to the larger literature that, in many other contexts, has found this uh, trade-off between. Uh, economic and cultural assimilation, this uh, this substitution between economic and, and cultural assimilation that you're finding, because I, I really think it's it's highly relevant to that literature far beyond uh, the immigration refugees literature. I'm thinking of the, the, uh, the, there's an, uh, an Antman and Duncan uh, 2015 Restat paper uh, where they document that people switch racial identification in accordance with the relative labor market returns to that identification. Uh, there's a fascinating uh, job market paper by a woman named Nyla uh, Shofia uh, out of Bocconi this year, uh, documenting the, the adoption of traditional uh, dress by uh, young Mus Muslim women in uh, Indonesia uh, responds to uh, positive shocks to labor market opportunities in the export sector, uh, both of which are finding a, 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 a substitution between, between economic assimilation and cultural assimilation that uh, I, I really think could raise even further the impact of your work. Thanks, Michael. Okay, so Celine, uh, we're already over time. If you have one quick response to one of those questions. I'll have a, have a, a quick response. Uh, first to, to Michael, thank you very much. This is a very, very useful pointer. I think this is exactly where we want to go. We, we don't know where this paper is right now in, in sort of the framing and the, and the direction. So this is really going to help us in, in, in anchoring it. And to think when in Eli, I don't know why there is the assumption that refugees are culturally more different from right-wing people than, than not. Um, I think this is something to be empirically tested just because um, refugees are, um, uh, are not tolerated by right-wing voters. That doesn't mean that... Um, that their interest in politics is different, that their leisure activities are different. So, so there's this dichotomy, which, which I think is, is sort of a, a mental shortcut that, that immigrants must, must favor other immigrants or that, that um, the preferences of immigrants and those that are against immigrants must be naturally further apart. I think this is not necessarily the case, but we'll definitely look at this. And when it comes to the placebo test, I would have to think We've lost Solin. Yeah, we've we've lost you, Solin. So, anyway, I think we we've reached uh, the time. So, thank you very much, everybody who attended, and thanks to the three uh, authors for this uh, very interesting uh, topic. And I'm sure it's a uh, uh, it's a fascinating research agenda. And so we will see uh, more on this paper and on other uh, studies looking at this uh, this issue. So, Simone, you want to say something about next week, next seminar? Ne and then the conclude. next seminar is going to be on December 16, Stephanie Stanchela, and that's it. Thanks for being online with us. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Goodbye.